Welcome back. In this video, we're going to take a look at another core component of Dart, the fact that it is an object-oriented programming language. You've probably heard the term object-oriented programming, or OOP as it's often called online, but you might not know what it means or why it's so important or powerful. Well, there's a really, really, really basic way to look at this. There's two things in object-oriented programming that you really need to be concerned with. The first is what's called a class. Now I want you to think of class as a blueprint for an object. So let's give it a real world example. If you wanted to build a table, you would come up with some blueprints that you would call table. And any time you wanted to make a table, you would use the blueprint table to create the actual object of a table, which is the physical table in the real world. Well, guess what? It's actually the same in software. You can define a class. In this case, let's say you define a class called login bar, which is just a bar for you to type in your username and password. Whenever you want, you can instantiate or create a new object based off of that class. So you could have a whole page of a billion different login bars if you wanted by just typing new login bar, new login bar, new login bar, new login bar. So that's really what object-oriented programming is in a nutshell. It might not sound that useful or that important yet, but trust me, there are certain situations where using objects and using an OOP language is really going to save you time. And more importantly, it's going to make applications easier to understand, develop, and architect. So in case this sounded a little too abstract with you, let's go ahead and jump into code and see how this works. If you remember, a class is basically the blueprints for an object or for a thing. So let's go ahead and look at how you define a class in Dart. So let's see how this works in code. We're actually going to create a class of a person. So now we've created the class of a person. So what does that mean? Well, person is the blueprint. And we can use that blueprint to create as many people as we want. For instance, we're going to create a person named Jason. And we're going to make sure that Jason is using the person class. Let's create another person named Jeff. Let's create a person named Sarah. And let's create another person called Viewer. So the class here defines what a person is. And then these individual people, Jason, Jeff, Sarah, and the Viewer, you could use in your application to do different things. So if you had a method for Jeff called drink water, you could say Jeff drink water or Sarah dot drink water. So let's explore this a little further because right now this person class is not useful at all and the person object has no properties. So you can actually define attributes for each class. So we're going to define an integer called age. We're going to define a string called name. We're going to define an int called IQ. We're going to define a string called nationality. We're going to define a string called gender. Now you're going to notice something. There's an awful lot of red error messages here. Well, this is because when we create a class, we're going to want something that's called a constructor. And a constructor basically dictates what happens when you create that class. So for instance, we can define a constructor of person. And whenever we create a person object, there's certain data that we're going to want to have defined. So we're going to want to have this.age, and we're going to call this required. This means that every time somebody creates a person, they need to define an age. We're going to want to define required this.name. Every time somebody creates a person, it has to have a name. We're going to want required this.nationality so that everyone who is created has a nationality. And we're going to do the same thing with gender. And we're going to do the same thing with this.iq. You might be asking, why am I using the keyword this before those attributes? It's a pretty simple explanation. When you're using the this keyword in front of a variable inside of an object, it just means referring to this instance of the object. So let's go down here to where we have person. You're going to notice some errors here because we didn't define all the information we needed to. So Jason is going to be age 40. He's going to have a name of Jason. He's going to have an IQ of 210. He's going to have a nationality of USA and a gender of male. 
We're going to take a minute here and we're also going to define attributes for the rest of these people. Through the magic of editing, you can see we've defined our other people here and given them all the attributes we need. So let's go ahead and jump into some code and see what we can do with these objects. Now, if you guys remember from the first video, when you're going to execute code in Dart, you have to do it in the void main function. So we're going to create that and then we're going to go inside and let's look at what we can do. Let's say we want to figure out if Jason or Jeff has a higher IQ. We're going to use a simple if statement and we're going to say if Jason.IQ is greater than Jeff.IQ, then what should we do? We're going to print a statement that says Jason.name is way smarter than Jeff.name. Now I want you to notice something. We're doing something a little different in this print statement that I wanted to show you. Previously, in our last video, we showed you how to do string concatenation, which was taking two strings and combining them together. In this instance, we're doing what's called string interpolation, which means we're taking a variable uh, or an object and we're printing it out inside that string. So you actually define string interpolation by doing the following. You're going to put a dollar sign, then curly braces, and then whatever's inside those curly braces is going to be represented inside of the string. And you can actually see that I made a mistake here and put the dollar sign on the wrong side. So let's go ahead and test this application. Now this is a very simple application, you might notice. We're going to create a new terminal here, which a terminal is how you execute your Dart code. We're going to go to git bash, and we're going to type Dart OOP dash lesson dot Dart. Jason is way smarter than Jeffrey. That works. But what happens if Jeff is actually smarter than Jason? Well, we're actually going to use an else statement here, and we're going to print the inverse. We're going to print that Jeff.name is smarter than Jason.name. So let's just change the IQs here and see what happens when you do that. Let's change Jason's IQ to 109. It's printing the correct statement and saying Jeffrey is way smarter than Jason. So this is the bare bones, most basic way that you would interact with an object. You're going to notice something. Storing every single person in their own individual variable and then defining all of those individually is going to get a little slow and cumbersome to deal with, especially if you have large amounts of data. So how else might we deal with all these people objects that we've created? Well, one way that we can do it is to create a list. Now, I'm sure you remember what a list is from the last video, but just in case you don't, a list is an ordered list of information. That information can be any data type you want, and alternatively, it can be any object. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a list called people, and this is going to be a list of person objects or person classes. And then we're going to populate this list with the people that we had previously created. So now you can see we have our list of people called people created. So how can we interact with this? So we're going to use a for loop and we're actually going to go through this entire list. So if you remember, to start a for loop, you use the for keyword and then you're going to define an integer. In this case, I'm going to say int i equals zero and this is where the for loop begins. Then we're going to define the criteria for which the for loop runs. We're going to say we want the for loop to run while i is less than people dot length which means we want it to run for as many people as there are. And then each time we go through the for loop, we want to go i++. So now we have a for loop that goes through our list of people. What could we do? Let's go ahead and make a print statement that uses string interpolation to display some data. Hi, my name is, we're going to use string interpolation here, and we're going to say people, and we're going to access a person of the index i, which is in this case for the first time it's going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, which is how you access individual objects in a list. And we're going to say, my name is dot name. And I am, we're going to do string interpolation again, people i dot age. All right, let's run our application and see what happens. Hi, my name is Jason and I am 40. Hi, my name is Jeffrey and I am 42, and so on and so on. So this is a way that you can access a list to go through people and to manipulate the data of people. This is a much more useful and functional approach because if you remember, when we defined each person individually, we wouldn't be able to use a for loop like this. 
Now, what about if you want to add more people to this list? This is really easy to do. You can access the people list dot and use the method add, which allows you to add a new object. We're going to add a person. Their name is going to be Subalad. Their age is going to be, let's say, 99. Their gender is going to be female. Their nationality is going to be India. And their IQ is going to be 250. Now let's run the program again and see if we can see the proper information. Yep, you can look there. Hi, my name is Subalata and I am 99. And it adds on to the end of the list, which is important to realize. So that's how you can add people to a list. So if you were starting a new application, you could actually create a list of people and have it be blank and then programmatically add those people later. All right, so instead of using that for loop, what's another way that we could access all of the people in the people object? Well, it just so happens Dart actually has functionality built in to do that. So we're going to call our list of people and we're going to run a function called for each. So if you'll notice here, there's an argument called element and then there's brackets here, which indicates a function. Basically, this is saying what is going to happen to each person in that list. We're going to do print and we're just going to say, hi, I am string interpolation element dot name and I am from element dot nationality. So what this is doing is it's just going through each person on the list. It's creating a variable of that person called element and then we can access them inside of this function here and do whatever we want. So let's test this program. That works too. Hi, I'm Jason from USA. Hi, I'm Sarah from Italy. Hi, I'm from Sabaluda from India. I am the best people ever and I am from Germany. Everything works, it checks out, perfect. That's another easy way to iterate through a list of people or a list in general for that matter. So now let's change our application a little bit. Let's change our for each statement to the following. Let's have it print a person and list their name, their age, and their IQ. Since we've already done this before, this should be very simple, but you should always debug your application, even if you think it's a change that won't have any effect. All right, you can see through our output that our application is working. Okay, so now we have this list of people in our application, but what can we do with it? Well, first of all, I think it might be fun to sort the list by IQ. So now that we have this list of people and we can see their um, information displayed, why don't we go ahead and try to sort them? Let's sort them by IQ. We're gonna use a method that is built into Dart lists called sort. So if you notice here, we're calling our people list and we're running the sort method on it. Now inside of sort, you can see we're comparing A to B. Now all that means is we're comparing the first element of the list to the second element and so on. After that, we're using a compare to method to compare A.IQ to B.IQ. So let's hit control S and then let's run our program. So you can notice that it's sorting everybody in order of their IQ from 109 all the way up to 250. Now, what if we want to reverse that? What if we want to see who has the highest IQ? We're actually just gonna add a minus sign to the front of that statement. Let's run it again. It's sorted by IQ from highest to lowest. But I'm seeing a pretty darn big problem here. If you noticed, Subalata, Subalabata has an IQ of 250. Sarah has 211, Best People has 150, and Jeffrey has 110. Those of you that know me probably already recognize that I am a maniacal egomaniac so the fact that I am not showing up first on the IQ list is completely and utterly unacceptable. So we need to correct this error. So there's actually a somewhat easy way to do this. So we know that this list is sorted in order of IQ. And we know that people zero is the first item on the list. So we can run the following if statement. If people zero dot name equals e is not equal to Jeffrey, then we need to do something. I want to point something out. This is how you denote not equals to, an exclamation point and then an equal sign. If people name is not equal to Jeffrey Booth, we need to do something. Okay, so if the first person isn't Jeffrey, we need to know where Jeffrey is on the list. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new integer called the ID of Jeff, because we need to know which index in the people list is Jeffrey. 
we're going to say equals people dot index where so people index dot where and you'll see that we have a variable here called element and what are we going to do with element we're going to say where element dot name equals equals you always have to use two equals and sometimes three when you're doing comparison otherwise you'll be assigning the variable which makes no sense in this instance equals Jeffrey. So now we should, when we run print the ID of Jeffrey, we should get an ID, an integer. Let's run it, see what happens. We get an ID of three. That means Jeffrey Booth is stored of index ID three in the people list. So let's try this. Let's print, just to make sure we're getting the right person, we're gonna print people the ID of Jeffrey. And we're going to make sure that it shows Jeffrey's name. It shows instant.person. It shows an instance of person. That's because we didn't define an attribute. So let's say name. There we go. It says Jeffrey. So now what we need to do is very simple. We need to set people, the ID of Jeffrey, dot IQ, to be equal to people of an index ID of zero, which is the person with the current highest IQ, dot IQ plus 50. Because we want me to be smarter than everyone else by a lot. I mean, if we're being honest. So let's go ahead and run the program and see what happens. Ugh, what the heck? It didn't work. Well, if you notice, the sort statement occurs before this if statement. So we need to go through and we need to actually run sort one more time after that statement. And run it again. Now we can see all as well. Jeffrey is 42 years old and has an IQ of 300, topping the list as expected. Now, I know all of this might seem a little bit simplistic to you and maybe even pointless, but I wanted to introduce you to several things. The class system, which is how you create a blueprint for an object. In this case, our class is person. I wanted to show you how you can create objects or instances of classes. I wanted to show you how you can manipulate those objects by using them in variables, by using them as lists. I wanted to show you how you could add objects to lists, how you could manipulate and sort them. It's actually a lot of very useful functionality here. So take a little time on your own. Practice these concepts. Experiment with them. Try to create classes of your own. For instance, as a recommendation, I recommend trying to create a class of car. What attributes might you assign to a car? Might you assign a year? An engine size? Might you assign how many doors it has? Think of it and write your own class and post it in the comments below. And if you're very ambitious or slightly more experienced, start thinking about what methods you might assign to a class and learn how you might do that. And also post that information below in the comments if you do so. Until the next lesson, I want to say thank you for joining us. Please, please, if you don't mind, thumbs up, subscribe, click the bell if you really want to. It would be much appreciated. Until next time, this is Jeffrey Booth. Have a great day.